morning. Well, good morning. Thanks for weathering Snowmageddon 2024. Uh, and uh, it's great to be with you. And I was like a little kid last night. I kept looking out the window of my hotel, watching the snowfall. I, tempt, I was tempted to go out and do snow angels this morning, uh, but I was afraid I couldn't get back up. So, uh, and I wanted to make it to church. So thanks for weathering the storm. Those of you that are here, those of you online, uh, I believe there's no distance in the spirit. So wherever you're watching tonight, uh, this morning from around uh, Connecticut, New England, and around the country and the world, uh, we welcome you. Uh, I believe that we are living in the greatest time that the earth has ever seen. I believe that we're living in the greatest days that the church has ever seen. And I believe that you, you have been born for such a time as this to see the kingdom of God advance, to see the Lord get the reward of his suffering. Amen? Uh, I believe that the hand of the Lord is not too short, that he wouldn't save, that he wouldn't heal, that he wouldn't uh, release his power in our midst, not only this morning, but in the earth in this hour. And I believe this, that the Lord is removing fear from the equation concerning the future. I love this thought that, that the God who is omniscient, he knows everything, he knows the end from the beginning, uh, knows every detail of your life, and, and, and he, he absolutely, out of his love and mercy and grace, covers you. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful for the kindness of mercy? Aren't you thankful for the amazing love of God that continually gets poured out? And uh, I just believe right now the Lord is, is up to something so powerful in the earth that we're about to watch entire families be uh, transformed and born again. We're about to watch cities actually be discipled. We're about to see nations discipled in a day. And I know it's true because Jesus said it would happen. Aren't you thankful that he keeps his word? I love this about the scriptures that the Lord, the Bible says that the Lord honors his uh, word even above his name. How many know the name of the Lord and the word of the Lord are one? Everything you need God to be this morning, he already is. He's already healer. He doesn't have to become it. He is it. Before the foundation of the earth, he, he, he always is and always has been the healer. He's always been faithful. I've been pondering this over the last few weeks uh, about the faithfulness of God. And I've looked back at the almost 53 years I've had on the earth. Uh, and I've realized this, that there's never been one moment where he hadn't been faithful. There's never been one moment where he hadn't been good. And I'm telling you that the faithfulness of God and the goodness of God is about to overtake you this year. I believe this with all my heart. This is a year of being overtaken. Not overtaken by the schemes of the enemy, not overtaken by fear, not overtaken by politics, not overtaken by all of the stuff that's happening in the world, but being overtaken by the goodness of God. Aren't you thankful for that? I believe that with all my heart. This morning, uh, what's burning in my heart today uh, is this. It's what's always burning in my heart, and it's just the pure, raw gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, like Pastor Eric, uh, try to read through the Bible every year. I, I love Genesis to Revelation. I love the, the first word to the last word. But over the last couple of years, I find myself getting lost in the Gospels. And I'm reading through, but every day I, uh, I, I, I find myself getting so lost in the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And every time I read it, this is been my journey over the last couple of years is every time I read the scriptures, every time I read the gospels, I meet a Jesus I never knew. I have been walking with God now for almost, uh, it'll be 27 years this month. Uh, and, and, and to actually every day meet something or connect to something or learn something about Jesus you never knew before is pretty powerful. Uh, I think that's the way that God designed it. That every day that you search out a dimension in his heart that you never knew the day before. Uh, and, and so this morning, I, I want to go there. Uh, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is in the book of, chapter, uh, of Mark chapter 4. Uh, and when you get to verse 34, something amazing happens. Jesus has been ministering. He's been pouring out. He's been uh, among the multitudes. He's been meeting needs. He's been feeding people. Uh, he's been casting out devils. He's been healing the sick, opening blind eyes. People have been absolutely being uh, transformed by his power and his presence and his love, and it's beautiful. 
Uh, how many know that Jesus is fully God and that part of him never gets tired? But as he was walking the earth, he was also fully man. And like you and I, there was human moments where he actually got really tired, right? And, and so his desire in this moment is he wants to leave the multitudes with his 12 disciples and he wants to go across uh, to the other side of the lake, the other side of the sea. And he just wants to be with his father and to be with his friends. And he says, come, let us go to the other side. Now I'll pause there for one moment. And I will tell you this, that I believe that the Lord is saying prophetically to us, it's time to cross over. It's time to actually leave where you are to go where you've never been. I believe that the worst place, the saddest place we could be is in the same place as, as, as last year. The saddest place for me to be is on January 31st, 2024, being the same as I am today. Because the Lord's desire is that he transform me from glory to glory and faith to faith. So what do I have to do? I don't just have to change, I have to actually have to grow. And the Lord is calling us, he's inviting us to go to the other side because the winds of change are blowing us, are blowing us there, amen? And so he, he, his desire is to go to the other side. And like he said, come let us go to the other side. They get into the boat as they're moving. One of the gospels describes it like this, that Jesus is in the boat with the 12 disciples. There's other little boats around them. And all of a sudden a tempest, a storm comes out of nowhere and begins to beat into the boat, right? Remember the story? So here they are, they're in the middle of the sea. They're just, they're with Jesus. They're doing what Jesus wants to do. Jesus decides he wants to go to sleep in the stern. He goes to the back of the boat uh, on a pillow and he, he takes a nap. As he's sleeping, the storms come, the rain beats into the boat, the wind and the waves try to overtake the boat and the disciples forget everything they've learned in Mark one through four. They forget the miracles, they forget the healing, they forget that he'll never leave you or forsake you. Uh, they forget that he has all power and authority. They, they forget everything they've seen and they go inward into this place of fear. Can I tell you that I believe that fear is a very selfish demon? And the reason that fear is a selfish demon is that all it cares about is how does this affect me? It doesn't see the whole picture. It doesn't see the, 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 the process. It doesn't see the, the fact that God could do something so amazing in our midst. And they have maybe what is, we could call a faith failure. And they're there and they're talking amongst themselves. Doesn't he love us anymore? Doesn't he care about us? How could bad things happen to good people? We're doing what we're supposed to be doing. And this storm comes and we didn't sign up for this. Can anybody relate? I mean, when I got saved, I actually believed that everything was going to be great. And I had about a five minute high and then all hell broke loose, right? It's the way that, it, that it's designed. When the kingdom is within you, everything that's not in the kingdom is confronted around you. So you were created for conflict. You were created for adversity. You were created to endure the storms, not so that it would overtake you, but so that you could dis discover an anointing in you you never knew you had. And the disciples, they, they, they freak out. They decide that Jesus doesn't love them anymore, and how could he be sleeping in a moment like this? And then they decide that as the water's filling the boat, that they're going to go confront Jesus. Jesus is sound asleep. How many know 12 people were having a completely different experience than the other person in the boat? They were in the same storm, the same boat, the same circumstance, the same situation, and their response was completely different. Jesus was resting, and they were wrestling. The Lord's about to bring you out of your wrestle into a place of rest, of resting on the promises of God. And they go to Jesus and say, don't you care that we're perishing? I used to think that immediately Jesus like just jumped up like Superman and said, peace be still. But the more I actually study and learn and know Jesus, I think as they went to him say, Jesus, there's a storm and the water's beating in the boat and all of those things, I think Jesus kind of went like, hey, Thomas, can you hit the snooze? Hey, Peter, five more minutes. Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? There's a storm, there's wind, there's waves. And Jesus is like, oh, wow, a little windy, a little wet. It's the first waterbed in history. And Jesus is on it, right? He's not moved by the circumstance. He's not moved by the wind, the rain, the flood, because he's Lord over all of it. 
Are you hearing me? And he gets up and he just simply says, peace, be still. And the wind stops and the waves stop. And the disciples had no idea who they were with. Jesus begins to rebuke them in a very kind way. And he says, how is it that you have no faith? One translation says, where is your faith? What he's really saying is this. Faith isn't something you conjure up. It's not something you work up. It's not something you earn. It's not something that, 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 that you just get all emotional about. But faith is a person. His name is Jesus, and he's in the boat with you. And they said to themselves, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? I would submit this to you this year, that if you're going to go through a storm, you should have Jesus in your boat. I would submit this to you, that in the midst of the winds and the waves and all of the struggles and the trials, that will come in 2024. That you stay so close to Jesus And when the wind comes and the rain comes and the waves come, you let Jesus speak to your situation. Amen? Amen. I don't believe that we should deny facts. Facts don't scare me. They just tell me how to pray. And I'm telling you, in a world that is so caught up in facts, we need to speak faith. We need to speak the word of the Lord to the facts we're facing. Now get this. Jesus is still tired. He still wants to be with his father and still wants to be with his friends. So in in, in chapter five, verse one, it says, then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and, and no one could bind him up, not even with chains because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broke, uh, broke, were broken in pieces, neither could anyone t- tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, come out of the man unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? So Jesus is still tired. He, He still just wants to be with his father and get to the other side. And immediately as he gets to the other side, here comes a man filled with demons. And what does he do? He comes down and he worships him. And he says, please, I implore you, by God, do do not torment me. I believe he knew the power of God, but he didn't quite understand the goodness of God. And I believe we're about to step into a season where the power of God and the goodness of God are going to be so married together. The mercy of God and the miraculous power of God is going to be so married together. It's going to be so amazingly beautiful. I love this. Jesus immediately commands the unclean spirit to be cast out of him. And then he asks him this question. What is your name? I used to think that Jesus was talking to the demons. What is your name? What are you, a spirit of infirmity? Are you a spirit of confusion? Are you a spirit of of this or that? But the more I read this and the more I know Jesus, I believe really what he was saying is, hey, I know you're troubled. I know you're confused. I know you're in condemnation. I know you've been judged. I know the world around you sees you as crazy and naked and poor and ragged and out of your mind and everybody avoids you. And when they see you, they go to the other side of the road and they don't care anything about you, but you're really important to me. And I'd like to know your name. That's my Jesus. He looks at our humanity. He looks at our need. He looks at our struggle and he doesn't turn us away from it. He doesn't turn away from it. He actually puts his, faces his, puts his face towards it. Here's what I've realized. Jesus isn't afraid of my darkness. 
Jesus is not afraid of the darkness that's happening in the earth. He's not afraid of the darkness and, and the things that I walk through or am walking through in my life. Here's how I know. Pastor quoted it first thing this morning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was void and darkness covered over the waters of the deep. And then he looked into the darkness and then he spoke, let there be light. Can I tell you what God's doing right now? He's shining his face on our darkness. He's shining our face on the darkness of America, on the darkness of New England, on the darkness of, of the things that are happening in the earth. And the darkness can no longer hide from him. He's shining his face on our depression. He's shining our face, his face on our addiction. He's shining his face on our struggles, on our circumstance. And he's not pushing us away. He's drawing us close. Isn't that beautiful? And the man is in torment. Please do not, do, please do not cast me into uh, the abyss. He begins to cry out as we continue to read in, in this story. And he answered saying, my name is Legion for we are many. And also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the swine that were there, uh, may, uh, so, so all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. Uh, there were about 2,000 of them. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned into the sea. Listen to this. Are you ready? Jesus speaks, peace be still to the sea. The wind stops, the waves stop, right? Immediately gets to the other side and there's a confrontation. And there's a man so tormented, so in need. He begs the Lord, heal me, but he actually tries to dictate the miracle. The, the demons actually, are, are you hearing me? The demons actually have a conversation. They're actually praying to Jesus. Don't send us to the abyss. Don't send us out of the country. Don't torment us anymore. And Jesus answers the prayer of demons. And, and he puts them into the pigs. That's how much he loves the man. And the demons enter the pigs, over 2,000 of them, and they jump off the cliff into the sea and they drown. What body of water did they drown in? The same body that Jesus just spoke peace to. So Jesus will create an atmosphere of peace to drown every demon you're facing. In the midst of your storm, in the midst of your torment, he, he, will, he will drown the enemy right in, your, right in his presence, right in your midst. It, it's the peace of God that is beyond a feeling. It's the peace of God that is actually power in this hour and in this moment that we're living in. Are you hearing me today? That kind of peace that passes all understanding is being released to us so that we can navigate the hour and the time and the season that we're in. Some of you right now, on the seventh day of January, you need Jesus to say, peace be still. Peace is our portion. It's not a feeling, it's a person. He is the Prince of Peace and he abides in me. I'm telling you right now, the power of peace is, is about to fill this place. And connected to it is miracle power. When Jesus cast the demons into the pigs and they jump off the, the cliff, here's what the townspeople did. They came to Jesus and they said, hey, that's way too much God in church. They were comfortable with the man and his bondage. They knew what times he would come out from the cemetery. They knew what times he, he would act crazy and they would just avoid him and go to the other side. They knew what to do in his bondage and, and, and his 
uh, and all of the things that he was happening with, but they didn't know what to do with him and his freedom. And Jesus upset the system. And the, and the townspeople and the religious leaders begged him to leave. And Jesus answers the prayer of the townspeople and the religious people. And he agrees to get back in the boat and leave. And they're getting ready to leave. And here comes the man who just got set free in his sound mind. And the man says, Jesus, I just want to be with you. I just want to go with you. Will you let me come with you? And Jesus said, no, you can't come with me. I need you to stay right here and tell everybody what happened to you. And in a moment, he went from a maniac to a missionary. In a moment, he went from naked, crazy, tormented, beat up, rejected, abandoned, nobody wanting him, to all of a sudden the Savior of the world saying, I've got great need of you today. My friends, there's glory on your story. And whether you've known the Lord your whole life or you've walked through some things like me, the glory of the Lord is resting on the story of your life. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that, that the Lord isn't afraid of your darkness, but he actually steps down right into it because he, does, he loves you too much to leave you the same. I, I love that about him. I love that about him. I watch the Lord on a daily basis restore lives, give people hope. I was preaching in our home church last Sunday and in between services, this amazing lady came up to me, probably mid-40s, and she just said, David, can you give me one reason to live? Can you just give me one reason to live? And I think sometimes we forget why we exist as the church. There's a part of us that's called to be a training center, an equipping center. I believe that with my whole heart. But there's also a part of us that's called to be a trauma center and an emergency room where the broken and the afflicted and the tormented can come and encounter a Jesus who, who loves them too much to leave them the same. And I was able to say, here's not only one reason, but I think she got tired of me after about reason 100. <laughs> and the beautiful thing is this, is that in a moment you can watch somebody's countenance change. I, I, I watch it every, I watch it every week of my life. A couple of years ago, I was in a, at a drug and alcohol rehab center. On that occasion, I wasn't a patient. I was actually there just to minister. And I got there early and uh, I met the, the guy that was uh, leading the, 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 the night when he was getting ready to graduate the program. And when I walked in, I said, hey brother, how you doing? He said, I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. And I realized that in nine months they taught him how to speak Christianese, which I'm thankful for. We were walking down the hallway and I meet another guy and I love this guy. This guy was amazing because he was extremely honest. And I said, hey man, how you doing? And he said, brother, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. I've been here six months and I still have cravings and I still have using dreams. And every day I want to run out of here and I just want to get something and I want to get high. But I choose to stay the course because I know that if I don't, I'm going to lose my entire family. And I love what he shared with me because it was amazingly honest. I have this sneaky suspicion that often our healing is connected to our honesty. The woman with the issue of blood coming to Jesus, just letting it all, just telling him the whole truth. Right? It's a beautiful thing. I went in to the cafeteria. I was there early enough for dinner. I'll never forget it. It was an Italian meal night there. They had Stouffer's frozen lasagna that they cooked up. And I don't care what you say, it's pretty good. <laughs> Especially if you're hungry. Right? They had garlic bread. They had, uh, this was in North Carolina, so they had uh, green beans like we make in the South where you, you, you make uh, some bacon fat. Come on, somebody. Right. I know you're giving it up for 21 days, but after 21 days, it's going to be gooder. I promise you. All right. Uh, and, and then you put some onion and garlic in there and then you put the green beans and then a little bit of sugar. 
Come on, somebody. If you don't believe in speaking in tongues, that will make you speak in tongues. I, I promise you. <laughs> right? Uh, and, uh, and, and an Italian salad just because I want to be healthy. Uh, and, and, and then a sweet tea to wash it all down, right? So I have this cafeteria tray. I go and I, I sit at this table. There's a young man uh, across from me there. Uh, and I said, hey, man, how you doing? And he said, I don't know you. I don't want to know you. Don't even look at me because I, I, I hate you already, is what he told me. And I sat down anyway, and I, I tried to make conversation. And he said, I, don't, I, I know you're the guest speaker tonight. I don't want to listen to you. I'm tired of all you guys coming in here and, and being all uh, the way you are, and I don't like you. And, and, and he's, just, he's got all kinds of walls up. And he said, if I, if, if, I, uh, if I had my way, I would just spit at you. I would just cut you. I would rather just kill you than look at you. And so I was like, can you hang on a minute? I, I want to get my phone out. Can, I want to go Facebook Live. Can you let everybody know how persecuted I am right now? Can you just, I didn't do that. Uh, it, can I tell you something? That wasn't persecution. And that wasn't rejection. That was just a birth pain. That was somebody in pain saying, I'll reject you before you reject me. I'll, I'll push you away before I give you the opportunity to push me away. It was a pretty quiet meal, although it was delicious. And we went into the auditorium, and I tried to do what the guy asked and not look at him, but I couldn't help it. He was on the third row uh, in, in the middle. And as I'm just sharing my life story, he's looking at me, and he's making all kinds of hand gestures. And it's not like, hey, good preaching. Like birds are flying through the auditorium. He's, he's making signs like he's got to cut my throat, like all of this stuff. And I just start telling the story of my life, of how at six years old I was diagnosed with mental illness and was a schizophrenia, uh, with a schizophrenic and struggled with uh, depression and I tried committing suicide 10 different times beginning the time I was 13 when I tried to hang myself in the rafters of our garage and the rope broke. And how at 17, I tried to drive my car in Lake Michigan, but it ran out of gas. And how I tried to do it again, and I hit a semi-truck, but I didn't get a bump, a bruise, or a scratch because I had my seatbelt on. I wanted to die. I didn't want to get hurt. You missed it. When I, my Bears fan over there, he got it. You're going to get a great word because you're a Bears fan, and you laughed at my joke. Your hair might even grow back by the end of this. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm, I don't have that much power. No, I'm just kidding. Right? And, 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 and just how I just was so miserable. I ran from God. I ran from the call of God on my life. I remember on Easter Sunday, 1994, my grandmother had a massive stroke. And they said, if you want to see, uh, see and say goodbye to your grandma, you need to get to the hospital. And I went. And, and my grandmother was in a, a, a coma and her lungs were filling with fluid. She had a death rattle going on. And all of a sudden, she just sits straight up in the bed. And starts singing, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, to thee all the folly of sin I resign. She goes back out in a coma and comes back up three more times and finishes the entire song. We were with her till about two in the morning expecting her to pass in the night. The next day I went to check and at 8.30 in the morning my little grandmother was sitting up in the bed drinking tea and eating a piece of toast. And when I walked in she said, David, it was, uh, I know you were here last night, it was my night to go home and be with the Lord. But he kept me alive to tell you this. The Lord won't repent and he won't relent. He's not changed his mind about you. He's called you to go around the world preaching the gospel. Wherever you go, lives will be touched and changed. Then she paused and said, you'll be the one to win your brother. Fifteen minutes later, my grandmother passed away and I went running from God. I moved to change states. I moved from Chicago to Wisconsin. If you ever get the opportunity, don't do that. Uh, th there's Packers there, and we don't like Packers. They're, they're mean people. Uh, and, and sorry for anybody watching. I know there might be one or two watching today, but the Lord loves you anyway. Um, and I'm trying. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and, and, uh, and I just went running from God, and, and, uh, and the same issues followed me. People didn't know what to do with me, and a phenomenon began to happen. I'd sit in the bars, and they would kick me out, no longer for fighting but for preaching. 
I would get drunk. I would sit next to somebody. I'd go, hey, man, Jesus loves you, man. Died on the cross for your sin, man. And they would say, make up your mind, Wagner. Be a drunk or be a preacher. You can't be both. Even we know that. And misery didn't want company. And I stayed running from God. I met a girl. We were doing all the things you shouldn't do before you got married. And uh, uh, she had a crazy Christian mother who believed the whole Bible. And every time I would go to the house, she would say, I love you. And I'd say, I don't love you. She said, I, I'd say, I hate you. She said, I'm praying for you. I said, don't pray for me, pray for you. And the unthinkable thing happened that the girl gave her life to the Lord and gave me an ultimatum that if I wanted to stay with her, I had to go to church. It was one of those churches that believed the whole Bible. And I said, I'll go, but if anybody rolls in the aisles like you holy rollers do, I'm out of there. And if anybody speaks in tongues, I'm gone because I don't believe in anything, but I know for sure that's not for today. It didn't take long. They had a guest preacher that day. And the guy came out dressed up like a clown. Okay, clown hat, clown hair, clown nose. Uh, he had a, a clown suspenders, had a flower that squirted water, clown shoes, and he preached on a unicycle. He was a missionary to Spain, and he was actually... Um, um, showing us how he ministers to the children in the squares of Madrid and tells the, the gospel story through balloon animals. It was, it was weird, okay? And he's on a unicycle, and I, I said to the girl, like, hey, holy roller, let's go. And she said, no, just wait. And the guy had all of these awkward moments where he, he would lose place in his notes. He would, wouldn't be able to find the scripture. So there was always these, all, all of these awkward moments of silence. kind of like that. And all of a sudden, in one of those awkward moments of silence, a lady three rows in front of us lets out in tongues. And the guy on the unicycle gives the interpretation. There's a young man here. You're 26 years old. You've been running from God your whole life. The world's called you alcoholic and schizophrenia, but the Lord's called you son. And he's not changed his mind about you. He's called you around the world preaching the gospel. Wherever you go, lives will be touched and changed. And you'll be the one to win your brother. And I wept, but I didn't respond. I didn't come forward. And I, here's what I believe, that every revelation requires a response. And whether it was pride or fear or condemnation, I don't know what it was. The relationship ended, and, and I never forget it. On January 17th, 1997, I took 250 prescription pills, a bottle of gin, and a 12-pack of beer. And I laid down to die, or so I thought. Nobody knows how it happened. I ended up in a church 12 miles away from where I was living in front of a pastor his first day out of seminary. Welcome to the ministry. I dropped dead in his office. I uh, was dead for about five minutes. They called the ambulance. They resuscitated me. I spent two and a half days in a coma. They called my mother. They said, you might as well forget you ever had this son. He won't live. If he does live, he'll be a vegetable the rest of the days of his life. He won't walk. He won't be able to talk. won't be able to take care of himself. And they wanted her to make me a ward of the state, to sign me over to the state. But my mom told the story, how she sat on the steps of her condo in Chicago and said, devil, uh, Satan, you can't have my son. And God, I don't even know how you do what you do but I'm asking that you make my son a miracle. I named him David because I always believed he'd be my little shepherd boy. And about that time, a bright light came into the room and the Lord revealed himself to me. And all I can tell you is that I died crazy but woke up in my sound mind. I died empty, but I woke up hungry for God. From that point on, God just completely, radically changed my life. And when the Lord woke me up, I prayed this prayer. God, if you can love me when I can't love myself, I'll serve you the rest of the days of my life. It's why I'm here. And when I shared that part of my testimony, that if God, if you can love me when I can't even love myself, the young man on the third row that had come against me interrupted my message and said, that's all I need right there. And he jumps over the rows of chairs and comes, stands in front of me with six of his friends, gives his life to Jesus. As I'm ministering to him that night, I'm praying for him and giving him a prophetic word. He begins to scream out. He knows me. He knows me. He knows me. God knows me. He knows me. 
It's the power of the prophetic. It's the power of the gospel where God steps into your darkness and all of a sudden you realize God knows me. He knows me. He knows me. It's why we exist as Cornerstone Church. It's why the Lord has put the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in Cheshire, Connecticut. It's why we exist in New England and America and all the nations of the earth. It's not so that we can have great meetings. It's not so that we can have great services, but, but it's so that people can come and know the Lord. I shared this yesterday at the Dream Team meeting that I believe that this is gonna be a year where we will not have a week without salvation that we would see salvation come to entire households and families and family trees and family lines. I am convinced of it. Here's what I love about Jesus. Even in the midst of where it would seem like he was weary, he still stopped for one. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that Jesus would have chosen to stop for one. And he's standing still in this place today Here's what I love about God. He doesn't judge me by my history. He calls me to my destiny. And I wonder what would happen if we got the eyes to see the people around us by their destiny and not just by their history. I've learned this, that it's not how you start, but how you finish that counts. And I believe the Lord is releasing the anointing of a finisher upon the people of God in this room. Here's where I believe we're we're entering into in, in 2024. We're about to watch an outpouring of the mercy of God and the miracles of God. We're about to watch the Lord do the impossible. Would you agree with me for that? That we're gonna see people healed. We're gonna see people set free. We're gonna see the, the lost get found. Families restored. The hearts of fathers turn to children. Children turn back to fathers. It's the beauty of the gospel. Dave, why are you sharing this this morning? Because the Lord is putting the gospel at the very forefront of this year. It's the very simplicity of the gospel that we've complicated. What I love about the gospel, it's not religious at all. It's not political at all. It doesn't classify us, it identifies us. And I just believe right now, there's a commissioning coming in this room today. I'll end here this morning. If you feel like you're in a place of darkness today, the Lord's not turning his back on you. He's shining his face right in the midst of the darkness. Whether it's depression or divorce or addiction whether it's some sickness or disease or failure. He's shining his face into the darkness and the darkness doesn't have a chance. It can't hide. And I believe today that today is the day of salvation. Here's what I love about Jesus. When the man came down the mountain, came down to the the dock where Jesus is getting off the boat. Jesus didn't say, hey man, I know you have needs. I know you're tormented. I know you'd really like to be free today, but I'm really tired. And I'm gonna go off for a couple days and maybe we'll meet up again here later. Jesus never said that. You know what I love? is Jesus Jesus never told anybody, come back tomorrow. Jesus never told anybody, come back tomorrow. Because today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of healing. Today is the day of miracles. Can I give you a prophetic word? It's going to sound real simple. Get your hopes up. In 2024, get your hopes up. I know maybe in 2023, hope seemed deferred and made their hearts sick. But in 2024, your longings, your faith, your desire is about to be fulfilled. 
and trees of life are about to burst all around this region and in your life personally. If you're here today, the reason I tied my story into my message is that God's not a respecter of persons. If God can save me, he can save anybody. It's been 27 years and I can't tell it without crying because every time I tell it, it's like the first time. And every prophetic word I give, it's like the first time. And I never want to lose that wonder. I never want to lose the awe and the wonder that the God of the universe could reach down into the disparity of man and say, you're worth saving. You're worth the blood I shed. The Bible says in Hebrews that it was the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. If you want to know what that joy was, he saw your face. And he said, they're worth it. And I just believe right now there's about to be an outpouring and an anointing released upon this church. It's going to be for healing. It's going to be for miracles. It's going to be for the prophetic ministry. But all of it's going to be for the sake of evangelism. And I don't know how to explain it other than I, when I walked in the building and on the property yesterday morning, I felt like the weight of evangelism coming upon this house. And it may not be in packing out stadiums and event centers. It might be you in your practice or on your job or in your school, just ministering to the person right in front of you. Because they're worth saving. Jesus thinks you're to die for. You realize that? Jesus thinks you're to die for. What a glorious gospel. What a beautiful Savior. What an amazing God who reaches down from heaven and changes the course of human history. Right now in this place, I'm going to ask you as we close for every eye to be bowed, and, or every eye to be closed, every head to be bowed. If you're in this room today and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, Maybe you don't even know why you came out in a snowstorm. I can tell you why you're here. You're here on purpose because God doesn't do anything by accident. The Spirit of God drew you. If you're here this morning and you've never made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, or maybe you did and you find yourself away from God today, His arms are wide open. His face is shining towards you in whatever darkness you're in. The Bible said, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And there's no other name in heaven or in the earth by which a man can be saved other than the name of Jesus. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God, you're a child of God. Jesus took it one step further. and He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. And today, I, I know that many are watching online. I know that. Many aren't in the room because of the storm. But if you're watching online or you're in the room this morning, you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, I'd invite you to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I give you everything. I give you my past. I give you my present and I give you my future. I admit I'm a sinner. I've broken your heart and your law. But I believe you're my perfect Savior. Would you come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior, be my very best friend. And from this moment on, I choose to live for you. If you prayed that prayer, would you let somebody know in the room today? Would you go into the comment section online and let us know so that we can pray for you and, and bring you into uh, and connect you and, uh, and, and help you be a part of the, of the body of Christ. And Lord, right now, I thank you for your presence upon your people. Lord, let today not just be a good message and a good story, but Lord, let there be an impartation of the prophetic and the evangelist to come upon your people this morning. Lord, I thank you that there's miracles in the room. I don't know who's listening this morning. I don't know who's in the room this morning. But I saw the gavel of God coming down 
and your righteous judge, the Lord Jesus Christ, is overruling and overturning every judgment of the enemy. You may have received a death sentence from a doctor, and I speak healing, and I speak life. Overruled today in the name of Jesus. You may be facing financial bankruptcy. I don't know what it is, but I felt like there's divine intervention in the room and the Lord is hitting that gavel down and he's overruling. Lord, I thank you right now that, Lord, that you would show up, that you would overrule, that you would overturn the judgments of the enemy and you would release the mercy and the love and the purposes of God this morning. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name,